What's up, everybody? How you doing today? Happy Memorial Day weekend. This is a weekend to remember those who gave their lives, laid down their life. The Bible says there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. And so this is a big, special weekend for our country. Also for our church, this is a big, special weekend. We just got our Nicaragua team just came back from Nicaragua this week, wherever you are. If you went on that trip, would you just stand up real quick wherever you are? Come on, let's give them a huge hand clap. And I don't, Max over here. Listen, I heard that Max preached a message. How old are you, Max? 16? One six? I heard that Max preached a message that like the whole rest of the week everybody was talking about. You're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome. Everyone who went on this trip, you guys are amazing. I'm so thankful that you guys went. And uh, the thing about missions trips is they change us too. You know, we go to, to, be, to make a change, but we also are changed. And Max, it's just the beginning, my dude, just the beginning. Um, I had something else I wanted to say. What, what is that? Oh, today we celebrated in the prayer and praise at the end, Ali talked about Tia. Will someone go get Tia from the back room? Wherever she is, look, four people are running right now. Praise God. I just want to honor Tia for a moment. Tia um, stepped in she, uh, at VSU. She stepped in as the interim, like an interim vice president, essentially. And she just, uh, I want to say audition. What's the right word? She just um, went to interviewed seven times to have that position be her actual job. And she just got the job. And so, Tia, we just want to honor you right now, right where you are. Would you guys just, <laughs> vice president of VSU right there. Don't you move. Don't you move. Tia, what I love about you is here you are, 70% of the school reports to you. And here you are in the back room clicking the message slides for, for my message, which makes me feel super humble right now. Thank you. You're an amazing person. We're so proud of you. And uh, I love, I love, she said 70% of the school answers to her. That's so amazing. So Tia, we love you. Thanks. Thank you for being a humble servant here, a part of our family. And thank you for being everything God has called you to be. You're amazing. Love you. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, I want to, I want to, we're, we're going to do a two-week mini-series, Okay. And this mini-series is called Suddenly. And the reason we're talking about Suddenly is uh, because Pastor Roy was here last week. And I believe he prophesied. Uh, prophecy is one of those words that maybe people don't understand. But he, I, I believe he looked into our future and I believe he said, there is a suddenly season coming for your church. And uh, you were in a season of prison confinement. And now you're coming into a season of divine opportunity. And so I wanted to just take two weeks and lean into that word and digest that as a church because I do believe we're right on the cusp of a suddenly for our church. So I want to pray and then I want to do two things today. I want to talk about what a suddenly could do for us. And then I want to talk about how we're going to, how we're going to prepare for the suddenly. All right, does that sound good? All right, I'm going to pray and it's Memorial Day weekend. So maybe if you guys amen loud and you clap, and all that stuff, maybe I'll be done early, and you can go to Cracker Barrel, okay? All right, that's good, that's good. God, help us. Help us to hear your word. Help us to do your word. Help us to receive your word. As James says, receive the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Help us today to receive your word with gladness. Help us to do your word, and help me to preach fast in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said Amen, amen. Uh, question for you, do you like surprises? Okay. Raise your hand if you are a I love surprises person. Only if they're good, okay. Raise your hand if you're a tell me everything beforehand. I need to know what we're doing for my birthday. I need to know who's gonna be there. Don't even surprise me with the gifts. Just tell me what you're gonna give me. 
every, I'm a surprise person. I love surprises. And Kenzie is like, just don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that, right? I'll surprise her and every now and then she'll like it. But like every Christmas, I'll give her something and I'll try to surprise her. And she's like, I don't want this. <laughs> and I'm just like, surprise. <laughs> she's like, I don't want this. And then a year later, she'll say, so every Christmas, no joke, every Christmas, I'll get her something. She's like, I don't want this. I try to surprise her. I don't want this. We take it back every year. The next year, she says, Kyle, I think I want that for Christmas this year. And it's whatever we took back the year before. So she doesn't like surprises. She likes to warm up to an idea. She likes to know who's going to be at the party. She likes to know what's going on. Well, listen, this happens in our faith as well. There are some people who do not like surprises, and there are some people who, like, live for the surprise. And you can tell because some churches, when you walk in, they have a bulletin. (laughs) That laugh was from someone who likes surprises. They have a bulletin, and the bulletin has everything that's going to happen that day written out, like, word for word. And if you veer from that, everyone's really uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, this was not on the agenda, you know. But then you also have seen the YouTube videos of the Pentecostal church where literally someone is swinging from the chandeliers. (laughs) And those guys don't like something unless it was a surprise, right? And so, you know, we talk about liturgical churches, which are more traditional churches that follow a flow of worship. The Pentecostals have a liturgy too. It's just a liturgy of chaos, What we love, what we Pentecostals love is, surprise me, God, God could do anything today. God could do whatever he wants to do today. Surprise us, God. Shock us, God, right? And in those kind of churches, we're so excited because worship went long. We didn't get to the message today. Someone fell out in the Holy Spirit. It's all about surprise and shock, right? And I believe that if we're going to be mature Christians, it's not about numbing one of those two options, It's about walking in the fullness of those two options. What I mean by that is I believe that if we're supposed to be, if we're going to be who we're called to be, that we have to walk and flow in the day-to-day submission. Day-to-day. We actually have to be comfortable with boring. We actually have to be okay with today I'm just going to do the right thing. I'm just going to settle in. I'm just going to be obedient But we also have to be okay with a God of the suddenly. That it's possible that you're doing the mundane, boring thing, but God has other plans today. If we live purely for the suddenly, our lives fall apart and we become chaotic. If we live in rejection of the suddenly, our lives become, we we sell Like, we sell God short of what he is able to do and what he wants to do in our lives. And so I want to kind of reject the bulletin church, and I also kind of want to reject the swinging from the chandeliers with no order church, but I want to be a church that walks in the fullness of the suddenly. Now let me talk to you suddenly people for a second. You already accept the suddenly. Not everything has to be spontaneous to be God, okay? Noah built an ark. He didn't spontaneously build an ark. It took time. God gave him exact plans, and he built that ark, and it took time. God gave Moses the the picture of the tabernacle. I want you to build it this way. I want you to do it this way. It took time. It took labor. It took obedience. It took planning, right? It took all that kind of stuff. So we should embrace that as part of the Holy Spirit. In fact, at Acts chapter 2 in the upper room, the Bible tells us that they were all together and they were praying and suddenly uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them. But what we often overlook is the other thing they were doing in the upper room. They were doing church leadership in the upper room. How do we know this? We know that Judas was one of the 12 apostles. He kills himself and now they come in and they're saying, we, gotta, we need church leadership. We need church order. And so what do they do? They're electing, they're, they're choosing a new person to be the 12th apostle. That's leadership. That's planning. That's strategy. That's also godly. And it's also led by the Holy Spirit. So suddenly people, 
hey, let's just settle in. It's okay that sometimes we need boring, mundane, you know, that's okay. Now let me talk to you boring people for a second, okay? <laughs> you guys, and I say you guys because I lean on the suddenly side, right? You guys are, are, are sometimes, sometimes you won't let God do something in your life instantly. And you punish yourself believing that it must take time. When God wants to do something in your life, suddenly. And so in your life, God is presenting you with a suddenly and you're like, no, 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 God, I don't feel like I've earned that yet. I don't feel like I, I can do that yet. I don't believe I'm ready for that yet. What if God wants to bring a suddenly in your life and propel you into what it is God has for you? And what if it's not gonna take years and years and years? What if God overnight wants to grab a hold of you and project you into the future and open a door that no man can shut? Are you hearing me today? I want to talk to you about what a suddenly can do in our lives. Um, uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 25 says this, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Why are there prisoners listening to them? Because Paul and Silas are also prisoners in this story. What has happened here? They have seen a demon-possessed girl who was telling people's future, and the city was making money off of her telling the future. And they cast the, the demon out of her, and now people are mad because they lost their income stream, and so they lock Paul and Silas up in prison. Have you ever been locked up in a season for doing something good and not bad. I think that, uh, Pastor Roy said it last week, but I feel like in a lot of ways, our church has just been, gone through a confinement season for no fault of our own, right? We're, we're here, we're serving, we're worshiping, we're not doing anything wrong, and yet we're in a confinement season. Here are Paul and Silas in a confinement season, and it says they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I can only imagine what the prisoners were thinking in their head. Like, dude, this is what got you put in here. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. What are you guys doing? You know, but they were listening. And listen to this. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Before I go any further, this is a very cool suddenly. That the foundations of the confinement are shaken. That the doors of the confinement are opened. That the bondage chains fall off. And they didn't just fall off for Paul and Silas, they fell off for everybody. Verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. So the jailer's asleep, there's an earthquake. He wakes up to the earthquake and he looks and the doors are open and the, and the shackles are, are on the floor. When he sees that the doors are open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And when the jailer called for called for lights and rushed in, uh, sorry, when, uh, where am I? I'm losing this. All right, here we go. Um, and the jailer, someone tell me where I am. Right at the bottom. Great. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Okay, the guy who was in charge of watching Paul and Silas in the prison and keeping them in prison is now falling down before the prisoners. Just moments before this passage, we hear that they beat them before they threw them in prison. This jailer, maybe, I don't know, could have been one of the men who literally just right before this was beating Paul and Silas, flogging Paul and Silas. And now, He's at their feet, trembling with fear as he fell down before them. Go to the next section here. 
Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. I love this. The people who heard you talking about Jesus and thought you were crazy, the people who saw you singing and worshiping in the confinement, the people who thought you had lost your mind, when this suddenly happens, they're like, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right before the suddenly, they're inflicting wounds. And right after the suddenly, the jailer is now a Christian and he is washing his wounds. And he brings them into his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and, and, he, bap and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had, be that he had believed in God. This jailer had been hearing Paul and Silas rejoicing in prison, and after the suddenly, they're all rejoicing in the jailer's house. The very guy who was watching them and keeping them locked up and keeping them in confinement and keeping, moments later, he's baptized? Who's baptizing him? Paul and Silas are baptizing him. Baptizing his family. These people were prisoners five seconds ago. And now they're baptizing the family. They're baptizing them and now they're all rejoicing in the home. This is what a suddenly can do. A suddenly can shift a confinement season into a season of, uh, of salvation, into a season of rejoicing, into a season of those old wounds finally being washed and tended to and healed. A suddenly season can take your singing and your worship and your praise that people thought was crazy and add to the choir because people are like, you know what? I thought your worship was insane. I thought you were crazy. I thought you had lost your mind, but now I believe and now I see. What is this suddenly? It's an earthquake, but for us, it could be anything. What I love about a suddenly is right when you think you know what God's going to do, he doesn't do it that way. In fact, I have tried really hard in my life not to give God clues of what he could do because I know he's not going to do anything I say. So in my life, I've, I've been like, God, you know, we have this bill that we need paid and we don't have the money. But here's, what, here's a couple ideas, God, of what you could do. It's never what I thought it was going to be. Ever. God loves, because, because if, it's, if it's what we told God to do, is it really a suddenly? Do you know what I mean? Whether you like surprises or not, God likes to give surprises. Whether you like surprises or not, God loves to give surprises. He loves when we're sitting in prison and we're just accepting, this is my fate, I'm locked up, I don't know what's going to happen here, and I'm worshiping. Notice that Paul and Silas are not saying, God, please let us out of here. God, please. They're, they're worshiping. They're singing praises to God. And what happens? An earthquake. And I believe when God brings us suddenly, it's one of those things that it cannot be denied. You know, that was God. That was God. God is the God of the suddenly. I believe we as a church, if you missed last week's message, you need to go back and listen to it because I believe Pastor Roy gave us a deposit. We had a guest speaker last week, by the way. And um, man, I love Pastor Roy. He's amazing. He's an absolute, he's, he's a father in the faith to me. He's a great mentor and pastor in me and Kenzie's lives. He encouraged us all weekend long. It was amazing. But what he did Sunday morning and really even Sunday night was he 
prophetically kind of spoke to us, you're about to come out of a prison confinement season and you're going to come into a divine opportunity season. And what I believe is that we're about to experience a suddenly in our church. A suddenly that we're just like, what? How? Why? <laughs> what did we do? You did nothing. This is God. You know? Well, so is this because of our good behavior? No, this is because God's good. Is this because God, no, this is because God's awesome. Is this because we gave God ideas of how he could let, nope. This is because we embraced the season we were in. We praised and worshiped God. Our worship, by the way, in this, in this last few months, in this season, I feel like we're Paul and Silas. I believe that our, Pastor Roy leaned over to me in worship last week, and he said, he said, um, I've, I've been here before, and your worship team's phenomenal, amazing. He said, but there's something different in the crowd this time. And the worship is just gritty and raw, and I love that. And what he was, what he was saying is, like, we're all just joining in and reaching out to heaven and saying, God, we need you. And, and we're Paul and Silas, and I believe that in our confinement season, our worship has increased. Our prayer has increased. And it's not that God's rewarding our worship and prayer by doing the suddenly. He's doing the suddenly because he's good. He's doing this suddenly because he's good, not because we're good. But there is something beautiful. And right about the time that we just settle in and say, God, we are where we are. I want to speak to you personally right now. Maybe you are in a season where you feel you felt stuck. You felt just stuck. You don't know what's coming. You don't know how to get unstuck. I just want to encourage you. I believe what's about to happen for our church can happen in your life personally as well. Don't get tired of doing good, the Bible says. Don't get tired of doing good. Just keep at it, keep serving, keep being faithful. And as you do it, I believe there's going to be a moment where, oh my gosh, there's an earthquake. And all of a sudden, the people that were holding you in, in bondage now are healing your wounds. What I love about the rest of this, I'm not going to read it, but what I love about the rest of this story, Paul and Silas are still in prison technically. They're at the jailer's house. They are still in custody of the jailer, okay? But they're eating the jailer's food. They're baptizing the jailer. They're worshiping and praising together. In verse 35, when you keep reading, the magistrates come and they send the police and they tell the jailer, let these men go. And I love what Paul says. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys locked me up in public. You're not going to let me go in private. And so what do the magistrates do? If you read the rest of the story, they publicly declare Paul and Silas free. They publicly release them. I love that attitude of Paul. Whoa, 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 whoa. There was a lot of bad press when this went down. There's going to be some good press now. I want people to know that that earthquake that they experienced the other night, I want people who were sitting in their homes that night and felt the earthquake to know that my God was moving. And you're going you're gonna to let everybody know. Here's the exact line. They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So now they, they come and personally apologize, and they're like, hey, will you please leave the city now? You've now cast demons out of people, and now we've had an earthquake. Guys, can you please just leave us alone? I love that. This is what a suddenly can do. Now, I want to shift into talking about how we are going to prepare for our suddenly. Is this okay? Are you alive today? Memorial Day weekend. Right now, you're, you're, you're doing math in your head about how many hot dogs you need and how many hamburger, hamburgers. And why are the hot dogs, they come in packs of this, and the, ham, and, the, and the buns come in packs of this, and... 
Why is this? Okay, let's focus on this just for a minute, and then I'm going to let you go, okay? How are we going to prepare for our suddenly? In Joshua, after Moses died, Joshua was preparing his people for the suddenly that was about to happen for them. And he says there's three things that he says that I want to charge our church with, okay? Number one is in Joshua 1, 10 through 11. It says, Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. When we're about to come up on a suddenly season, how do we prepare? Number one, I would say, prepare your provisions. Prepare your provisions. What is this speaking of? This is speaking of getting your natural order in order. This is getting your household and your natural things, getting them in order. Being ready for whatever it is that God wants to do in your life. When you're waiting for a suddenly, pay off your debt. When you're waiting for a suddenly, put some money in savings. When you're waiting for your suddenly, get your marriage straight. When you're waiting for a suddenly, you know, uh, get, your, get your home in order. Prepare your provisions. Why? Because I believe when God moves, we don't want to be unprepared and unready. Even from a natural standpoint, we need to prepare our provisions. It may not sound spiritual, but when you're living paycheck to paycheck every single month, not knowing how you're going to make ends meet, we have a group, Financial Peace University, that literally can help you. Get your life back in order. Get everything right in order. I know these times are hard. Trust me, I understand. We all are going through things are double what they cost a couple years ago and all this stuff. I I get it. But that doesn't mean that we can't prepare. Prepare our finances. Prepare our health. Get healthy. Prepare your provisions. Go for a walk for the first time in 20 years, okay? Prepare your provisions. Clean up your diet. Clean up your... Prepare, get ready in the natural even for what it is that God is about to do. Why? Because I want to be at my healthiest when God moves. I want to be debt paid off when God moves. I want to be ready to go. I don't want to just sit around and wait for the suddenly and miss out on the preparation season of what God has for me. Do not deny the preparation season. This, okay, so I'm really thankful that like seven of you are saying amen right now. The rest of you, chop your credit card tomorrow. Pay it off. Get your life in order. God is about to move. Three days from now, your life is going to look different, Joshua is saying. Three days from now, we have been used to something for 40 years that in three days is going to look totally different. Prepare your provisions. Get your life In order, go to the doctor, get your blood taken, let them tell you what's wrong with your diet, clean it up. Are you hearing me? This is not unspiritual. This is get ready for the journey. Go for a run, get some fresh air. I'm going to just keep saying this until I hear somebody. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Prepare your provisions for three days from now, things are going to look different. When God moves, I want to have my life in order. Okay? Number two, Joshua 1.13, remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Number two, when we're preparing for our suddenly, is remember what God has spoken. I believe it's time for us to brush off the old dreams that we thought maybe we just missed God. I want to remind you, this was a 40-year-old dream. Listen to this. When Moses came and started, you know, saying to uh, Pharaoh, let my people go, it was a very short season before the people were free. 
But Moses also said, God's going to give us a place of rest and we will, he will give us the land. And for 40 years, that promise just sat there. It would be very easy after 40 years to let that dream, let that promise, let that call get a lot of dust on it and to just bury it in the wilderness. But Joshua is now stirring up our faith to remember what God has spoken. I believe it is time in our church to look at each other and say, you've been saying that for 17 years, maybe now's the time. I believe it's time for us to look at each other and say, God put a dream in your heart and you have let it die. Maybe it's time to pull that thing back out. I believe it's time to stir one another up in faith. Get, get, get some faith again for those dead dreams, those dead word, words from God where, man, we felt like God spoke this, but now we're at a dead end and what's going on? Don't give up. If God has spoken it, it might take 40 years, but let's not lose hope. Let's not lose faith. Let's remember what God has spoken. Remember the word. If, if some of you keep a prayer journal or, you know, Kenzie always makes fun of me because I do. I have a prayer journal. And uh, whenever, whenever she walks in the room and I'm sitting there, she goes, dear diary. <laughs> Today, I, no. It's a prayer journal, and I often write down things that I feel like God is speaking or stirring. And the reason I do it is because five years from now, I want to look back and go, wow, look what God did. But there are some things in that book that God has not done yet. And I believe it is time for you, if you keep a prayer journal, I believe it's time for you to pull it back out and stir yourself back up again. Remember what God has spoken. Remember the word of the Lord. Remember what he has spoken. A 40-year-old dream that has died is about to happen in three days. All right, this is, this is on fire and you guys are asleep, okay? Okay, here's the last one. I don't usually like berate the audience, like, you guys suck, you know? Yeah. But today I'm going to, okay? Yes. All right. I apologize. You guys are amazing. I love you. You're awesome. Yeah, you're asleep. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> Here's the last one, okay? Joshua 3, 5 says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Here's number three, when we're preparing for our suddenly, is consecrate yourselves. We talked about getting the natural in order. We talked about stirring our faith. What are we doing here? Consecrate means be holy, set apart from common use. In other words, what is happening in my life is not just common use, okay? Going to work every day and just earning a paycheck can be common use. Now, I've preached many times about our work being worship. But what I'm saying is we can fall into a rat race mentality where we're just going to work, we're paying our bills, we're doing this, we're doing that, and we're just doing the common use thing. Or we can come alive to the God purposes that he has for us. And then even our work can be sanctified. So consecrate means be holy, be set apart from common use, and it, and it means sacred preparation. Sacred preparation. This means that we're getting ready for God to use us. Are you hearing me? God's going to do a suddenly that is going to have implications for us. And those implications are going to be that you and I are going to need to be set apart and ready to do the things that God has planned for us. If Paul and Silas were just sitting in there playing tic-tac-toe, and the suddenly had happened, they would have walked free and they would have said, oh, praise you, Jesus. But because they were consecrated and set apart and they were worshiping and they were glorifying, when the suddenly happened, the jailer's whole household came to faith. So consecrate yourselves, look at your life. 
and say, am I set apart and ready for divine use from God? Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay, here's what I love about this list. Right when you think, oh yeah, that's not me, (laughs) not that, right? There's something in here that you're like, oh dang it, that's me, you know? We got everything in here from, you know, sensuality, orgies, and drunkenness, and all this stuff, all the way over to just jealousy. I'm jealous. That is a work of the flesh. Right? And then he says these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those, do, uh, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How do we set ourselves apart? This is not some, you know, ritual thing that we have to do where we get on our knees and we say ten Hail Marys and we do this. It's not that. Consecration is saying, God, no longer the flesh. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me today. Help me to be full of the Spirit. Help me to walk in the Spirit. Because Galatians 5.16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you are satisfying and gratifying the desires of the flesh, This is not a flog yourself, beat yourself, hit yourself a bunch of times, come into church, Hail Mary, Mother of God. You know, it's not that. It's walk in the Spirit and those things, you will not satisfy them anymore. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I've said this to our team many times. But we, this year, are not focused at all on growing the numbers of our church at all. In fact, we celebrated, we had planning meetings two or three weeks ago, and we celebrated that the crowd of our church has shrunken. I know that sounds crazy, but, but hear me out for a second. A year ago, we, said our, we had 2,000 unique people who came to our church, a third in attendance every weekend, a fourth in a crew, and a fifth on a team. This year, our our overall number shrank, not a lot, but just a little bit, but half is in attendance every week. A third is in a crew. A fourth is on the team. Those numbers are moving in a direction of people waking up to their God-given call and purpose. I don't want a big church that isn't consecrated. I would rather have two guys in the prison who are consecrated that when God brings the suddenly, more can be added who are also consecrated. I don't want to build a big, giant community group. I don't want to build, oh, we had 3,000 this weekend. I don't care if we're not consecrated, set apart, for what it is God wants to use us for. God is about to, I believe, do a suddenly in our church. What do we need to do? We need to prepare our provisions, get our home in order, get our life in order, get that credit card paid off, get that student loan paid off, get that thing paid off, do all that stuff, okay? Do all that. We need to remember what God has spoken. Do you remember when God said, do you remember that guy who said, do you remember that dream that God gave me? Do you remember? We need to stir one another up and we need to consecrate ourselves. Because when the suddenly happens, you right now are sitting on the back row of the church and you're just kind of like, yeah, I'm here. But when the suddenly happens and you're consecrated, suddenly you're baptizing the Philippian jailer. (laughs) Suddenly, suddenly, you are put to use in God's kingdom. 
and you thought that God was only using this guy on the keys, you're awesome, and using me on the mic and using this person on this, and when this suddenly happens to a consecrated church, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, God just used me in a crazy way. And I was just at the store and all of a sudden I, I had this prophetic word for this lady and I prophesied over her and she was like, I was just at your church last week, this is crazy. You know, whatever, these are the things that happen to a consecrated church that is ready for the suddenly. Consecrate yourselves. Let me remove all fear and stigma. Our God is a God of love and a God of grace. The Bible says he is quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Do not take, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow God will do things among you. Consecration is not going to take you a month. It's not going to take you a year. It's not going to take you 10 years. It's not going to take you your MDiv. It's not going to take you all this stuff. Consecration can take you today so that tomorrow you can be ready for what it is God has for you. God, right now we thank you that you're about to bring us suddenly in our church. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know the nature of that suddenly. I don't know what it's going to be. But here's what I believe. God, that you right now want to prepare us. Get our home in order. Get our life in order. God, you want to stir us up. Help us to remind each other and remember what it is that God has spoken. And God, you want to consecrate us. You want us to be consecrated, set apart for the things of God, set apart for what it is that you have for us. And God, when that suddenly happens, when that suddenly happens, God, help our church to be in prime position to be the people you've called us to be, to do the work you've called us to do. We don't wanna build a big church, we wanna build an effective church. We wanna build a consecrated church. We wanna build a church that is able to baptize the Philippian jailer who five seconds ago was overseeing our confinement and now is joining our worship. We thank you for it, Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. In Jesus' name, amen.